Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Rosen Rubini podcast, Making Sense of This World. My name is Manas Chavla, and as always, I'm really pleased to be joined by CEO and Head of Research, Bernal Rosa. Uh, for the first episode of the year, we're doing a complete uh, revisiting of what seems to be the most important election year uh, in history, certainly the year when most uh, human beings on the planet will vote, uh, something more than sort of three and a half, four billion. Uh, in July of this year, of last year, we were to call them titled Elections in 2024, uh, where we targeted some of the key elections happening both in developed markets and in, and in emerging ones. Brunello, could you give us some insight on some of the sort of markets that we targeted, but also how the picture might have evolved in some of those countries in the last few months? So um, we identified this, this thing way ahead of everybody else. We knew that by December, everybody would realize that 2024 would be a massive electoral year. And therefore, we decided to write it about it um, uh, about six months earlier than everybody else. We identified six key elections, three in DMs and three in EMs. In DMs, of course, US, UK, and uh, the EU. And in DM, um, Russia, Taiwan, and India. But there are, of course, other uh, elections that are worth uh, considering. In Mexico, in June, for example, I mean, Mexico is a huge country just at the doorstep of the US. So clearly, it would be an important development, especially after uh, NAFTA has been revisited under the Trump presidency and became new. USMA, so US, Canada, and Mexico uh, agreement. Or in Venezuela, where there have been very interesting developments recently. We have written also uh, about the recent uh, territorial dispute with the Guyana. Or even the Ukraine, where there are supposedly elections in March, but clearly under the martial law, this cannot happen. So there will be an important choice by Zelensky to decide whether to carry on with elections or not. Most likely, they will be postponed to after the war. Um, so we thought it was very important to identify this theme early on. We put it on the table. Everybody else has found it as relevant as we did, and uh, it's clearly ahead of us. And we will need to follow very closely, starting from the um, uh, Taiwanese elections uh, uh, next week. I mean, rolling off of all of that, these elections aren't just happening in one type of country. They're happening across the spectrum in terms of political systems. Yes. Uh, and one of the sort of key arbiters of this knowledge is VDEM, or the Variety of Democracy Project. How do they sort of define some of these countries and how free and fair these elections might be and what sort of consequences that might have? Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, discussion, I think. Um, VDEM classifies uh, political system in two, four categories. One is what we call liberal democracy, where elections are held and the press and the judiciary are free which means that uh, you know, people should be or are supposed to be very well informed. And if, in case something goes wrong, the judiciary can independently act on that. Some are instead electoral democracies. So there are still elections, um, but press is not as free as in liberal democracies. And uh, uh, the judiciary is not as free as um, in a liberal democracy. In, even in Europe, in the EU, there are examples of that probably in Hungary and until recently in Poland. And we'll see whether uh, Poland will return to more liberal democratic uh, system. Um, uh, under our you know, radar screen, clearly Turkey features high in that characteristics as well. Elections are held, they are relatively free, but we know that courts and free and press are not as free as otherwise. Then there are the electoral autocracies. So these are countries in which elections are held, but then power is in the hands of effectively just a group of people, Russia being a, a primary example. We said that Russia is gonna have elections, but we all know 
the results of those elections already. Um, and then there are autocracies, closed autocracies such as uh, uh, China, for example, where elections are not had at all. So having these um, um, classifications is very, very helpful because it helps us identify um, democracy, not just as this one place where elections are held. Elections can be held in three out of four uh, political system, but you know they're all widely different one to another. Absolutely. I mean, perhaps the most one of the most critical ones uh, of the year is actually happening very soon. On January 13th, Taiwan and Taiwanese citizens will be going to the polls to elect their new government. Uh, what are the biggest risks that, that sort of this poses in the kind of geopolitical framing, particularly of China and Taiwan? So the biggest risk there is clearly that uh, China will start uh, a period of intensified um, um, destabilization at the time in which um, uh, the political system is fragmented and fragile because it's going through a transition. Uh, at the end of the year, in his year-end speech, President Xi Jinping of China said that the reunification of the motherland is a historical inevitability, and China will be surely reunified because China always considers Taiwan as part of the motherland. And so to some extent, uh, these are already indications that China is ready to start the period of intensified destabilization um, following the elections. And we don't think uh, an invasion is on the cards. That would be a stupid move. It, it will probably prompt a reaction by the US and its allies and so on at this stage. Uh, but they don't need it. They have time on their side. They can start this intensified destabilization and then finish the job 10 years down the line. Plenty, plenty of time for China to do that. Absolutely. Uh, looking towards Europe, uh, there's a big risk of uh, sort of populist parties and uh, anti-European parties doing well. Uh, where are you most concerned about? Well, we have seen the rise of populist party recently in the Netherlands, for example, or in Italy, uh, where Meloni is in government with Salvini, um, and clearly uh, France, uh, where Marine Le Pen is doing very well and my potentially win the next presidential election in 2027 when Macron will not be running. Um, but then, of course, there's the biggie, and there's Germany, where the AFD has been rising massively in the polls recently as the government is proving ineffective and the CDU under Smith's leadership is not gaining as much traction as they should. So uh, clearly something goes wrong in Germany uh, all the rest of Europe will be affected. Vice versa, if he, he, Italy and even France go in the wrong direction for a period, as long as Germany holds, you know, eventually we might hope for a return to more normal periods. But again, um, uh, the rise of populist party seems to be unstoppable at this stage. We need to see how far they can get to. And this leads me to the final point I'd like to make, let's assume there's all these the elections go, so to speak, in the wrong directions, which means more autocracy, less freedom, less um, uh, uh, power to uh, the democratic institutions. <clears throat> but then the US reaffirms the rule of law and uh, Trump doesn't win we still have a hope that eventually um, things will turn out to be all right. There's the vice versa though. <clears throat> the other extreme scenario is, in, is one in which to some extent all the other elections somehow reaffirm the rule of law and the importance of freedom. But then Trump wins in the US. In that case, it seems like the, now, the days of 
democracies are numbered anyway, given the <clears throat> size and influence of the US. So, and we will not know until the very end of the year. So it's gonna be, as we said in the title, a year of uh, living dangerously. Absolutely. 2023. Uh, even in the Trump race, uh, you can see how the different other sort of candidates are positioning themselves. Many of them uh, clearly want to align with Trump. They sort of accepted the reality that he's leading in the polls. The last one I saw was about a 55% chance of winning. Uh, and so people like Vivek Ramaswamy or Nikki Haley sort of gunning to be his running mate, effectively. Uh, so certainly a very precarious year to come, but one that we surely uh, will keep reporting on and keeping our audience uh, entirely up to date with uh, well before the time. But as always, Bernardo, thank you so much for your thoughts and insight. Thank you very much. Until next time.